Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. That's a nice welcome. A South Carolina boy in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> I think in this context, I'm going to speak a little bit differently than I did earlier today, which will be nice new material for some of you, I guess. Um, among friends, especially in a faith context, I think I'd like to uh, put it in, in the category of love is what we're talking about. And you don't normally hear recovering politicians or politicians talk about love. But I really think that's what this is um, all about. And for those of you who heard some of my story earlier, you know, that's, it really is in the context of love is why I'm doing this. Um, for six years, I represented the reddest district in the reddest state in the nation, Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, it's used to be one of the six, now there's seven districts in South Carolina because folks from Ohio are moving to Hilton Head rapidly. Um, and um, so uh, a pretty conservative place, right? It's home of Bob Jones University, for example. Um, it's uh, very evangelical, um, very Republican. Used to be Democrat, now it's Republican, um, starting with Reagan, really, in 1980. And so it is a solid red district. And I, so I represented the district for six years um, with a um, pretty much fitting the district. Um, I didn't know anything about climate change, but I knew that Al Gore was for it. <laughs> um, and I had a friend who used to represent New Haven, Connecticut in Congress, and he said, being sent to Congress is like being sent to Yale to take every course the university offers in the first year you're there. <laughs> and so you need some shorthands. You know, when you're in Congress and you're trying to take all the courses that Yale offers in the first year that you're there, you need some shorthands. And so for me, Climate change, that was a pass-fail course. Al Gore's for it, got it, pass, move on. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, uh, so some of those courses you take pass-fail and just move along quickly. That's what I did on climate change. Um, then I was out of Congress six years. Uh, I, I left out that I ran for the Senate in 1998 against Senator Fritz Hollings. Um, he'd been there 32 years, and we thought that this nice young guy should go up there, and at the time young, uh, should go up there and take his place. That didn't work out very well for me because 70% uh, right track territory in October of 1998, when I'd won a challenge race in 1992, is 70% wrong track territory. The first question on most national polls is generally speaking, would you say we're on the right track or wrong track in this country? And um, so 70% wrong track in 1992, I got elected. 70% right track in 1998, the senator got six more years. Um, he'd only been there 32, so we got to be 38 years in, in the U.S. Senate. Um, Fritz and I have turned out to be uh, friends. He's a, he really is a one of a kind, and I, I really always enjoyed him, but now I really enjoy Fritz because it's a little bit of a digression, but it gives you a, a fun little thing to know and tell about Senator Hollings, is that um, he used to say publicly that uh, he and Pizzi, his wife, got along just fine because they were both in love with the same man. And um, so he was very nice to call me up after the Profile and Courage Award was announced, which it really was very special of him to pick up the phone and to call me. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, if you can imagine, the Senate race was not that pleasant. And so we've had this opportunity for reconciliation. Um, and to see that happen in this relationship and have him call me up and congratulate was really very special. But he said to me, because he is in love with the same man as Pizzi used to be in love, she's uh, dead now, but um, since, since he is in love with that man, everything about Fritz is um, about Fritz. And so he said to me, Bob, they, gave him, they never gave me that award. <laughs> the Profile and Courage Award, and I said, oh, wow, this is bad. I mean, this is not kind of starting out very well. So he says, um, but I got something better. And I said, oh, really, Senator, what was better? And he said, uh, I got John Fitzgerald Kennedy elected in South Carolina in 1960. I got something better. <laughs> um, and so uh, 
<laughs> Anyhow, um, it's actually in that context of reconciliation, I guess, it is where I'm launching this whole thing about love and how this really could work for us in this effort. Um, so um, six years out after losing the Senate race, I did commercial real estate law again in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, I was running again in 04. Jim DeMint had taken my place in the House, and then he was running for the Senate when Senator Hollings ultimately decided to retire. And so uh, Jim got that Senate seat, and I ran again for the House in the same district that I represented. And uh, my son came to me, who's voting for the first time. He just turned 18. And so he's the oldest of our five kids. And so he said to me, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. <laughs> and um, so his, uh, his uh, four sisters agreed, his mother agreed, so I had a new constituency. You know? <laughs> Any one of them could change the locks on the doors. That's a very important constituency to respond to. Um, and so um, that was step one. Step two was going to Antarctica with the Science Committee and seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. Um, you know, basically what you see, here's a fun fact to know and tell, the South Pole is a desert. Uh, it gets a quarter of an inch of precipitation a year. At the South Pole, it's 10,000 feet above sea level. They describe their ski conditions there as a mile of ice and a couple inches of powder. <laughs> and so um, it's 10,000 feet, so it's 5,000 feet of dirt, and then there's 5,000 feet of ice on top of that. And since it's only a quarter of an inch of precipitation a year, we've got quite a record of the Earth's atmosphere. And so we drill down into those, into the ice, we pull up the ice cores and we study them, we see this level, we can test the level of CO2 in it. And so what you see is stability followed by this uptick coinciding with the Industrial Revolution, which only makes sense, of course. I mean, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> By the way, that turns out to be a very bad thing to say if you're, it, the pollsters will tell you that that is not a winner. It's a little bit like saying, I'm not a truck driver, therefore I have no position on highway funding. I'm not a doctor, therefore I have no position on health care. I mean, it's really qu quite a, uh, I think President Obama ended it for everybody when he said something like, yeah, but can you learn or something like that. He said, um, but anyway, so. Um, so I'm not a scientist, but I, I, I acted like, or played one when the lights came on at the science committee. And, but, so even though I'm not a scientist, I can see what's happening there, right? When this, this winter, when we were burning trees off of our farmette, my wife and I and raised our kids on a 27-acre little farmette. That's where you're not making a living doing it. You know, you're just playing at it with three horses and three chickens and a dozen more coming soon. And, um, Chickens, that is, uh, not children, uh, and uh, um, and uh, and so. Um, but if we cut trees on our property and burn them in the fireplace, we're just taking the CO, the carbon that we, has been sequestered into that tree, and is part of its life process. And now we are releasing it, uh, oxidizing it, turning it into CO2. It's all in the same geological time frame. No big deal. But if you go deep into the earth and you pull up vegetation that's been gone for a long time and under time and heat and pressure has turned into fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, petroleum, and you burn those, you're changing the chemistry of the air. And that's, that's inexorable. Nobody disagrees with that. Not even the most ardent dis, dis, disputer of the climate science disputes that. They also don't dispute that the physics of light have been known for a long time. That light enters, but the heat doesn't escape. All the heat doesn't escape. Thank the Lord, because if it did, we'd be freezing when it was night and burning up when it was day. And so it's a wonderful place that we live. Um, and so, um, so I saw that was step two for me, was seeing that science. It's also interesting that where, where the, you know, I'm, I'm putting this in the context of love, right? So it's the love of my son that, and his sisters, his mother, that really got things going. And then in Antarctica, the, the connection there with the science committee was going there with a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, you know, about the contest between faith and science, right? 
and a little bit of the reputation of the godless scientist. And then as I was on the science committee, I get to see more and more of these supposedly godless scientists who actually aren't very godless, um, you know? And, uh, and so there's one in particular on that trip, that, that, that trip to Antarctica, a guy named Donald Manahan, who's this master teacher who um, can modulate his answer to whatever level you're asking the question from. If he heard my questions, he was down at the GED level, you know? If he heard um, John McCain's questions, you know, he was up at the postdoc level or something, you know? And so, um, so and in the course of that, I found out that Donald has a mom in Ireland, and he calls her almost every day. And, uh, you know, he loves his mom. And um, we lost my mom two years ago at the time we, I had an elderly mom, too, and I would call her, you know? And so we were, it's just, you get to know these people and you realize they're not godless. And they actually, um, so there's a little bit of reconciliation there between, you know, the views, I suppose. Third step for me was a, really a, a, a true spiritual awakening um, on another science committee trip. Odd that that happens on a science committee trip, isn't it? <laughs> Most people would think, <laughs> how do you get spiritually awakened on a science committee trip? Well, a Great Barrier Reef, um, Aussie climate scientist showing us coral bleaching. And I could tell that Scott and I shared a worldview before any words were shared because of the way that he was worshiping God in what we were seeing. I could see it in his eyes. I could hear it in his voice. I could see it all over his face that he was just enthralled with the God of creation and that he was um, so I knew we shared worldview. You know, St. Francis of Assisi said, um, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. And so Scott, <laughs> Scott was using, it was without words, preaching the gospel. And so after we had this, we were seeing coral bleaching and he was showing us that stuff. We, we had an opportunity to talk and he told me about conservation changes he's making in his life in order to love God and love people people that will never know because they'll come after us. And I got right inspired. I want to be like Scott, you know, loving God and loving people. Uh, this is uh, Scott Heron, who's now a dearest friend that I write almost every day and um, who um, doesn't take the elevator, he takes the stairs. So, I mean, even earlier today, I, I took the stairs to my hotel room because I thought, you know, if Scott were here, we'd be taking the stairs. stairs. In other words, th this is the kind of thing. He rides his bike to work. Um, he does without air conditioning, except when his wife and three daughters can't take it anymore in Townsville, Australia. Um, and a lot of people would say, these are the smallest little things. What does this matter? This is nonsense, right? But it's Scott consciously trying to love people to come after us. And so I, I got inspired, came home and introduced the Raise Wages, Cut Carbon Act of 2009. And um, that's um, a way of pricing carbon dioxide. And so um, the bill that I had was a $15 per ton price on carbon dioxide, rising to $100 a ton over 30 years' time. Um, and it would have been offset by dollar for dollar cuts in payroll taxes. So, uh, you know, pay payroll tax is 6.2% employer, 6.2% employee, total 12.4%. It's the most regressive tax we have. Um, the carbon tax is regressive, but you can reduce, regressive, of course, um, I'm talking like an economist. I'm not a scientist, now I'm talking like I'm an economist, but I did take econ courses but I'm not like Mark Morano in the, uh, in, in the Merchants of Doubt. Anybody see Merchants of Doubt, the film? Yeah, you know, when he says he's, he took a course, he took a course, and now that's pretty much made him an expert. I won't say that. I'm not an economist, all right? But, um, but uh, the, 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 the point is that, um, that uh, if, if, since we have this regressive tax of a payroll tax, the most regressive tax there is, it, in other words, poor people pay a larger percentage of their um, available cash uh, than do wealthy people. And so um, the payroll tax is extremely regressive. The carbon tax is also regressive. But 
it can be avoided, at least in part. So by setting on the thermostat, you can avoid the car carbon tax by carpooling, by biking, by putting plastic on your windows in the winter, various things you can do. You have control over that tax. The payroll tax you have no control over unless you want to become an illegal employer or an illegal employee. Then you can evade the, car, the, the payroll tax. So the idea of pairing it was, even though we'd be regressive, that we'd be uh, reducing that regressivity by uh, reducing the payroll tax. So uh, the real world impact of that, by the way, is, as you know, a $25 a ton price in carbon dioxide, which is where most people say it should start, is 25 cents per gallon of gasoline and one to two cents per kilowatt hour, depending on where you live. If you're Indiana, you're at the top end of that range because they're 97% coal. If you're Washington State, you're way at the bottom of that list because they're so, uh, they have so much hydropower. And if you're South Carolina, you're in pretty good shape because we get 50% of our power is nuclear. So, so I proposed that bill. It got me in a lot of trouble. It wasn't the only heresy I committed. I was also for comprehensive immigration reform. Um, I uh, um, had voted against a troop surge in Iraq out of conservative concerns that George Bush was doing nation building there. Um, I suppose the district could tell that I didn't have it out for gay folks the way that perhaps the member of Congress of the Red History in the Red Estate should. Um, and, um, but my most enduring here, oh, and then I voted for TARP, which can never be forgiven by the Tea Party. <laughs> um, that, is, that is the um, unpardonable sin. Um, but my most enduring heresy was just saying climate change is real, let's do something about it. It didn't help me that I voted against cap and trade and had proposed this alternative that fits with conservative principles uh, because it was just seen as a tribal orthodoxy that you, we, we at that point uh, in the Great Recession, it's very necessary to say you don't believe in climate change and you shouldn't either. You know, is a very antagonistic, aggressive atheism as to climate change. We don't believe. And so I was a believer, and that put me outside of the tribal orthodoxy. Now, you might get discouraged thinking, oh, how do we ever change orthodoxies? Well, the thing that's interesting is orthodoxies are really quite fluid. You think they're fixed, but they're actually quite fluid. So take, for example, that vote that I mentioned on the troop surge. Well, let's see, how'd that work out? Um, I voted, uh, I was voting for funding, but I voted against the troop surge, right? The specific uh, uh, proposal of the troop surge. And it got me in a lot of trouble in the reddest district, the reddest state in the nation. But then, just in the 08 election, just a couple years later, um, we, uh, Ron Paul, not Rand Paul, but Ron Paul got 25% of the Republican primary vote saying that he was not just against the troop surge, he was against the entire operation. And so my party had switched from interventionist to a more isolationist position within a very short space of time. And then there were these barbarous beheadings, and my party switched back to interventionist. And isn't it amazing to see it flipping around that way? So the thing that's encouraging, I suppose, is that at some point we're gonna see the same kind of flip, I think, on climate change. Hopefully it doesn't flip back. In other words, that we, that we flip to action on climate. And um, so three steps for me, one was my son, Second, the science in Antarctica, and then the third, um, the love of Scott Heron in Australia and his uh, witness for the gospel, really. Um, and those, those things made me want to act. And so our great challenge at republicin.org is to figure out a way into the hearts of conservatives and to convince them that this is love that they can recognize as love that they share uh, because 
until you get through the heart, you'll never get into the head. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that wrote a white paper recently and the best line, the best sentence of a pretty sophisticated white paper is three words. Poetry precedes policy. And um, he, I think he's right that poetry precedes policy. In other words, you've got to get, to the poetry is about the heart and expression, and then it gets into the head, and then policy can be worked out. You know, I have an ad agency guy that uh, has helped me in all my campaigns and is now doing the work that you see on our website at republicen.org. And he, um, I, I told him one time, Greg, I think you're right. Most decisions are emotional. He said, correction, all decisions are emotional. <laughs> and um, so I've come to believe that's true. That really, and it's, that may seem offensive to some, particularly the scientists in our midst, maybe, that might be here. Um, or maybe a few economists, unless you're a behavioral economist, I guess, then you wouldn't be so offended. But, um, but I think it's really affirming of our humanity that we're not computers. We're not, we don't necessarily make rational decisions. Um, and that's a good thing. So it's sort of hard to explain love, isn't it? Um, for example, for a, um, uh, for a, a, a disabled child, there's love there for the parents, even though economically it's irrational, right? I mean, if you're looking at a utility, from a utilitarian point of view, you would just evaluate the utility of that life. But we value that life for reasons way beyond economics. Um, and it's all about the heart and about a heart connection and love. Then we also design good policy when we figure out how to make the economics work too. But it all. The best of it starts, I think, with love. And that's why we got to figure out a way to make sure that's communicated to conservatives. And we got to communicate it in language that they can understand. And Grant was mentioning that perhaps um, some in a slightly bluer shade here in Boulder. Not, <laughs> not, I guess Boulder is for blue, right? And. Uh, <laughs> I get, I'm looking for an R, R town, Roebuck in South Carolina. That's a red town. Um, so if, if you are a conservative, maybe this, you, you tell me whether this fits with what you think our tribe believes. And if you're not conservative, maybe it'll help you see that um, in the, when it comes to climate change, there's sort of, there's a, there's a language of abundance and there's a language of scarcity. And if you're talking to conservatives, you really want to talk the language of abundance. And, um, you know, um, the environmental left, as we call it, we're trying to organize the eco-right. Um, the environmental left, perhaps unintentionally, um, gives the impression that humans are something of an invasive species. Um, and whether they mean it or not, the way they're perceived, and some really are unable to see this, unable to see, uh, be self-aware. But the way they're perceived by the right is that they want us to all walk and eat bugs. Um, they want us to you know, feel guilty, sit in sackcloth and ashes, you know, sweat when it's hot, shiver when it's cold, you know, I mean, sit in the dark. And if that seems, you know, just crazy that there's no way the environmental, you know, if you're an environmentalist, let's say, and you say, that's not what we say, but I'm just here to tell you that's how you are perceived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you, if you're the reddest district in the reddest state in the nation, that is how you are perceived. Um, and so um, the language of abundance is, no, we want more energy, more mobility, more freedom. We just want it cleaner, better, faster, cheaper. And we believe that the free enterprise system can do that. And so um, it's a very different vocabulary. It's a very different, um, the validators of the message are very different than on the left. Um, 
Grant and I just had a meeting today with a fellow who wanted to know if perhaps some European voices could help us at republicn.org. Well, <laughs> I, I, I hope Grant said I was polite enough, but I basically said no. <laughs> no, really, thank you, but no. I mean, I can't imagine anything worse. I mean, like, you know, the whole conversation, this is what's happened with climate change. The problem is the IPCC did the work. The people with the blue helmets, Agenda 21, One World Government, did the, you know about Agenda 21, do you? You know, I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm sorry. See, even when you go out of your district, you, the jokes don't necessarily work. In, <laughs> in, in a red district, let me tell you, Agenda 21 is this thing where you go to the county council meeting and they rail about it. You have constituents that come to the county council and they're convinced that the UN is taking over Greenville, South Carolina, first of all, and then they're going to go to Pickens, South Carolina, and then Spartanburg, South Carolina. Anyway, so it's, this, it's, this, it's a conspiracy theory that involves... Um, um, how the UN is taking over. But um, so uh, um, if you've got this climate change conversation, start with the IPCC, blue helmets. And then it went with some godless scientists who were part of that report, of course. And then they got with the government bureaucrats to come up with a way to limit and to regulate and to control. Now, these words are not consistent with liberty and freedom and abundance, right? And so the setup has just been horrific for climate change, if you're on the right, because it's just not our tribe. And so, but um, the tribe that it fits with is communitarian egalitarians. It doesn't fit with hierarchical individualists. And I'm quoting now, I'm a disciple of Dan Kahan, who has this cultural cognition project at Yale. And he's done some very interesting work that shows that progressives and conservatives are very different personalities. That conservatives are hierarchical individualists. Um, that means they believe in hierarchy and authority and working through a chain of command and that they're individualists. They need to accomplish something themselves. They believe in merit, and they want to be able to say, what'd you do in the war, daddy? Um, that's what they need in order to feel successful. And so um, in the case of Merchants of Doubt, I didn't plead as too strong a word, but I asked a couple of times if Robbie Kenner could take out the scenes at the end of Jim Hansen being arrested. Because we want to use the film to try to reach conservatives, but conservatives do not chain themselves to the fence at the White House. They go to county council and rail about Agenda 21. They don't go to the White House and chain themselves to the fence. And so um, it just is a different uh, picture of how you do things. So hierarchical individualists. Now, on the left, you have communitarian egalitarians, Dan Kahan says. And those are people who believe in community and believe in fairness and are into egalitarian kind of thought. And so they're very different approaches to issues and really to life itself. Now, the truth be known, all of us want a, to have parents that are, a little, we, need, we need both, right? We need a parent that is the communitarian egalitarian. Johnny, we love you no matter what. And then we need the hierarchical individualist parent to say, Johnny, we need you to do better in math, <laughs> right? And so it's the two very different approaches. But a, a well-balanced kid really sort of needs both. Somebody to say, Johnny, we love you just the way you are. And then somebody to say, Johnny, get the grades up in math. Um, you need to study harder, buddy. Um, and so, um, so um, we, we, try, we message to the hierarchical individualist. And our messaging is pretty high octane conservative. In fact, maybe offensive to some here and some at this Boulder conference. Um, 
so far I haven't been stoned, but uh, anyway. Um, oh, wait a minute. I just better strike that. There's some states out here that do. No, no, no but anyway, so, um, uh, but anyhow, um, so, yeah, we, our high, high octane conservatism is something like this. We shout across the Tea Party fence. We say, no more cylindras. And they say, right, you know, Solyndra, that was a direct subsidy where the government was, profit, it was helping one company. Started by Barack Obama. No, no, it's a previous administration. Yeah. Yeah. Shh. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, no more cylindras. They say, right. And then we say, no more t production tax credit for wind. That's government putting its thumb on the scales for wind. Right, they say, no more of that. No more electric car credits. I saw some beautiful volts in the parking lot. I covet all of those, I will tell you. A confession is good for the soul, and I really want a volt. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we say get rid of the credits and you buy one if you want one. If it makes sense to you, buy it. Otherwise, it's a tax equity argument about why the people without the funds to have one like me, uh, you know, should essentially pay through the tax code for those credits. And, and so they say right to that, too. And then, and then um, we say no more under market leases on public land for the extraction of minerals. And, and there's a little bit of a right, right, from the right, but just a little bit of a right. Um, and then we get to the hard one, which is, and no more the biggest subsidy of them all which is belching and burning in the trash dump of the sky without paying a tipping fee. And, uh, and I get a, can I get an amen at CCL? Okay, great amen. Uh, I can't get many amens from over there uh, across the fence, right, yet. But we're gonna get there because with events like one we did at the University of Chicago called What Would Milton Friedman Do About Climate Change? Um, it's pretty exciting to know that uh, Dr. Friedman had things to say about, not climate change, but about pollution. And there are conservative ways to approach this that are actually very consistent with what progressives would do because we don't admit it much, and I should be careful because there's a camera running, but we don't <laughs> admit it much that uh, the idea that we're about is the same one that Al Gore has been for for at least 25 years. Um, and so if you think about how we really could bring America together here. And it takes just, an, back to this love concept, it takes an awful lot of grace in order to get through this. The left has to be able to forgive the drubbing they got on cap and trade from people like me on the right. And they have to be willing to extend, or they also have to be willing to give up the business model that has been so successful for the environmental left, which is to name and shame people when they do silly things or say silly things and actually seek the better for those people. It takes an awful lot of love from the left coming to the right. It also takes some grace and love and forgiveness from the right going to the left. <coughs> that the right says, listen, all you environmental groups that are giving me zeros and Fs and you know, failing grades on every scorecard, I'm willing to forgive you. And all of you that look like you want to walk and eat bugs and insist that I do the same, you know, I'm just going to overlook all that. And I'm going to seek the common good, the good for all. It's an awful lot of grace and an awful lot of love and forgiveness. Um, and you know, there are we, we've seen, though, powerful examples of how it works. I'm, I'm convinced that love is the most transformative force in the universe. And um, we saw it uh, last summer in the Mother Emanuel Amy Church. You know, those, mm -hmm. the families asked for nothing. They gave forgiveness, and they got changed hearts in South Carolina. I mean, things they weren't even asking for, they got. I mean, I, um, one of my, even in 1.0, I was big on, because I'm a Jack Kemp Republican, I was real big on taking that flag down off the Capitol. And we got it down from the top to street level, arguably worse, actually, because you could then see the thing. Um, but um, anyway, so 
I have some scars to prove the fight about that flag. But to think that the act of forgiveness would turn into that is just completely unexpected. Because when you unleash love, you have no idea where it's going to go. And that's what those families did. They, they, they asked for nothing. They gave forgiveness. They got changed hearts. The flag was removed. They didn't even ask for that. And so um, I, I think that's the, the, the kind of it, the level of change that we're seeking here. Is, is there some, it's got to be that kind of transformative force. Um, and it also comes to me with some honesty that we're all in this together, that we're all complicit. Because if you drove here in anything other than, well, it really, there's no matter how you got here, you probably used fossil fuels in some way. And uh, if nothing else, but in the petroleum that's in the tires or something. But you, you, we're all complicit. We're all in this together. And so we really need to extend grace and forgiveness to one another and then say, okay, now, what do we do now? And um, so uh, it's all about love, I think. It's all about finding that reconciliation that can come in that and bring the tribes together so that America can solve this. Really with the help of the rest of the world, but mostly for the rest of the world. Because we're the... We're the indispensable nation, and conservatives are the indispensable partners in that nation. And so um, that's that's our story, Republican.org. Let me see what questions you have or comments or.